Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we've studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Gospel in Galatians. This is number, lesson number seven in that series for August 12 of 2017, entitled The Road to Faith. Do we understand what the road to faith is? Well, let's see if we can figure out some interesting aspects of that as we study this lesson together. But of course, as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we review now one of the most critical portions of Scripture, one of the most important for us to understand about why you came and why you died and how that relates to your use of law, etc., May we clearly perceive what is here for us to learn is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we must begin by reading the critical verses here, so I'm going to do that right up front. Galatians 3, 21 to 25. I hope you have your Bible handy. Does this mean that, in fact, I'm going to start two verses earlier, back in verse 19. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is, and it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant, to whom the promise was made. The law was handed down by angels, with a man acting as a go-between. But a go-between is not needed when only one person is involved and God is one. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of different ideas about why he said God is one. Moving on then to verse 21, does this mean that the law is against God's promises? No, not at all. For if human beings had received a law that could bring life, then everyone could be put right with God by obeying it. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin. And so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is given to those who believe. And remember the biblical word, the Greek word for, the Greek word is pistis, which means faith, also means believe, it means confidence, it means trust. All of those words are translations of the same Greek word. But before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came. Now, there's the Greek there just says the law was um, in charge of us unto Christ. So there's two ways that could be translated. It could be translated until Christ came, or it could be translated to bring us to Christ. So keep those two alternatives up in your mind, in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. And there's the word trust, belief, confidence again. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. What does that mean? The law is no longer in charge of us. Well, so this lesson will focus on the relationship between the law and the gospel. And you just saw some of that information in those verses. It's a critical point for Christians. Some Christians believe that the law is no longer in effect. Others act almost as if the law is the whole story. So where is the truth? Has God given us clear instructions about the plan of salvation? Historically, God's covenant or promise to Abraham preceded the giving of the law on Sinai by 430 years. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, you know, some places it says 400 years, some places it says 430 years. It depends on where you start in Abraham's life. Do you start at the point where the promise was first given to him way back in Ur, or do you, do you start at the time where his son was born? And so, it, but that's, this, that's just a technicality. We have already seen that the later, later giving of a law that could never nullify or change the promise given, by, given many years earlier. God does not change. And of course, you know that that's in, there's a very interesting chapter, by the way, 1 Samuel 15, you ought to have a look at there. Look at Isaiah 15, 29, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 15, 29. Isaiah, Israel's majestic God, does not lie or change his mind. He is not a human being. He does not change his mind. But then if you look down a few verses later, um, verse 30, 
5 says, As long as Samuel lived, he never again saw the Lord, but he grieved, grieved over him. The Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king of Israel. The King James says he repented. What does repent repentance mean? Turn. Change your mind. Mm -hmm. So here it is, six verses apart. And earlier in the chapter it says, God was sorry. Then it says, God doesn't change his mind. And then it says, he was sorry. So you need, to, you need to have a look at that chapter and see if you can figure out what's going on there. It is true that by reading some verses from the Old Testament, it might seem like one could be saved by keeping the law. Can you think of an example? Well, look at Leviticus 18.5. How do you understand this? Follow the practices and the laws that I give you. You will save your life by doing so. I am the Lord. Isn't that pretty clear? What's wrong with that? Is there a, is there a fault of that? Well, you go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18, the similar thing. You stop doing the bad things, even yeah. though you've been doing bad things. You stop doing it, you're going to you save yourself. So. so what's the problem? The problem is we can't keep doing it. We, all, we are all sinners. God is the only source of life, not only physically, but also spiritually. And there's lots of verses about that. Um, one of my, couple of my favorites are found in Acts 17. Look at verse 25 and then we'll read 28. Nor does, and this is Paul's, you know, people, a lot of people think that Paul's speech to the Athenians was sort of a waste of time. Because he didn't seem, he didn't seem to have a lot of converts in Athens. But this speech is pretty incredible. In the middle of that speech, nor does he, that is he's talking about God, need anything that we can supply by working for him since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. So we're re indebted to him for how much? Everything. everything. And then in verse 28, as someone has, sa has said, and Paul here shows his skills, he quotes their own prophets. <clears throat> In him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. So it was a pretty impressive speech, even if it didn't lead to a lot of conversions there in, in Athens. So, so anyway. So Paul quoted that prophet, that uh, prophet in the Bible. Does that make that prophet inspired? Or did that prophet just speak something that was true? He spoke something that was true, and Paul quoted it. Doesn't mean that the rest of his works were. Inspired. Does not mean. In fact, we know for sure that the rest of his works were not true. A lot of it's not true. Um, well, he's no respecter of persons, and he sends his, causes the sun to shine and rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So, whoever is seeking truth, God is there to try to lead him on. But uh, like any of the rest of us, we may not always be seeking truth. We may just be yeah. seeking our own uh, exaltation in some way. If you ask a, a, a typical Christian who has some knowledge of Scripture, where do you read in the Bible that we're all sinners? Probably the most familiar verse would be Romans 3.23. Uh, let's look at that for just a second, if I can get my computer to go there. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But if you go back all the way to Solomon's prayer, when he dedicated the temple, he said, when your people sin against you, of course this is in the middle of his prayer, when your people sin against you and there is no one who does not sin, and in your anger you let your enemies defeat them, and take them as prisoners to some other land, even if that land is far away, and so forth, he goes on. So uh, they had that information way back in Solomon's day. And no one on this earth can live without sinning. Well, one of the best summaries, if you want to read more detail, is in the whole chapter, Romans 3. Much of it talks about the fact that we're all sinners. Paul correctly stated that the sin problem begins where? in human hearts. So how is the problem to be resolved? Well, in Romans 8, verse 3, he has a very interesting statement. What the law could not do because human nature was weak. Now, we said already that 
the reason why we can't live according to the law is because we're sinners, right? We're too weak. We, we keep falling back into sin. God did. What we couldn't do, God did. He, he condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son. So how does God condemn sin? Say, who came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. Some versions have to deal with sin, to take away sin. How did Jesus' life and death do away with sin? I mean, we're still committing it, right? Well, ultimately, uh, our old man, our, we die. Sinful natures? Our sinful nature dies. And the only way to life is through Jesus because we reckon ourselves alive. He is our life. And so in him, he's the new the new Adam, the second Adam of the new race. The old creation dies, sin with it, and we uh, come back, or actually even beginning now with the reception of the Holy Spirit, we enter into that new new life. I, I like to put it like this, and some people would probably consider this an oversimplification, but I think it summarizes pretty well. We have the choice, we can either relate to God, have faith in Him, trust Him, and do our best in that relationship to live a life like Jesus lived, or we will die the death that Jesus died. That's the choices. And Jesus made, makes the choice apparent just in His life and death, right? In one life here on this earth. But God has given the law to tell us what sin is. From the days of Adam outside the gates of the Garden of Eden, the sacrificial system was intended to teach us that sin leads to death. The law helps us to identify those dangers, dangerous death-dealing behaviors. Do we as human beings need such guidance? That would be the first big question in this lesson. Yes, Gordon. So is the Bible as straightforward about what the purpose of sacrifices was? Is it as clear as what you just said, that it's to show that sin leads to death? It's clearly in there. Is it as clear? No. It isn't in, in those so many words. I wish it were. Uh, not that I would consider myself in any way superior by, by thing. But the idea is there. You put together some passages, the idea is there. Um, so, suppose we take the law as having a guidance function, as having a mirror function, some would call it. As do we, after recognizing that we are sinners by looking at the law, what happens next? We need a me mechanism of cleansing. Okay. Okay. The first question would be, and here's where Christianity splits in half. I shouldn't say it splits in half. Most of it goes one way and a small part of it goes another way. Should we begin focusing on how to deal with our past sins or do we focus on how to prevent doing those sins or from keeping on doing those sins in the future? And remember Martin Luther, that was his big, big thing. How do I deal with my guilt? How do I deal with my, my past sins? And, and I mean, I never will never forget working with a a uh, group of young people, young couples, um, who invited me to come to their home and take them through the Bible from beginning. And these are people who were, had no, virtually no Christian background. One of them, one of the men had been raised as a Catholic. And he said as a kid, he used to pray that if anything was ever going to happen to him, anything dangerous he ever should die, he prayed that it would be on his way home from confession on Sunday morning because he thought that was the only time during the week he had any chance of being saved. <laughs> it just so he was all concerned about dealing with his past sins and I mean I don't know how all of you were taught um, what were you taught when you were younger about what happens to our sins and how we deal with them when we commit a sin it goes there on that record right and when we when we ask for repent when we repent we ask for forgiveness what happens 
And if you don't get all your sins forgiven, what happens? Right? I mean, I, I can't be the only one who was <laughs> taught like that when I was younger. Well, the death of Jesus is proof of the fact that sin cannot be ignored. Sin has very serious consequences. The human Jesus did not die of torture or blood loss. He died of sin. Now, you can see that this is a place where many people have different ideas about what actually happened. Of separation from his father, the only source. We just already read one, one of a number of verses that are in this handout. And if you want the handout, it's available on our, our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can have all this material uh, to study on your own. But... Um, Look at some of the verses suggesting that Jesus died of separation from the Father, and that separation was a result of what? That's not a tough question. What separates us from God? Sin. Sin, exactly. So what did Jesus say at the time of his, just before his death? About three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Now, we know from writings that we cherish and honor uh, that the Father was not, the Father was right there and all the, all the holy angels were right there, but Jesus couldn't see them. He couldn't feel their presence. He, you know, so he died the death that sinners will experience at the third coming when they finally admit that their rebellion is God rebellion against God is deadly. And I quote this from a very important place. This is from the chapter on It Is Finished. Um, no, I'm sorry. This is a chapter on, on, on uh, uh, Calvary in Desire of Ages, page 753. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. What does that mean? This is, a, this is a, a figure of speech. What does it mean? He couldn't see beyond the grave. Yeah. He could not, he, he knew he was dying, and he, he, he could not see exactly his way to see what's going to happen on the other side of the grave. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as a conqueror. There she spells it out. Or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. So why did Jesus cry out, cry out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why, why have you left me? Why have you, you know, forsaken me? He feared that their separation was going to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was a, it was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So what killed him? Broken heart. A broken heart, which resulted from? Separation from God. Separation from God. That's what he felt. I mean, I want you to think of, the, the lesson I would like to, to, to challenge you to think about out there is this. When you commit a sin, do you feel so terrible because of the separation is produced between you and God that you feel like dying. Well, here's another passage. God's spirit will not always be grieved. <coughs> it will depart if grieved a little longer. After all has been done that God could do to save men, and women too, of course, if they show by their lives that they slight Jesus' offered mercy, death will be their portion, and it will be dearly purchased it will be a dreadful death, for they will have to feel the agony that Christ felt upon the cross to purchase for them the redemption which they have refused. And they will then realize what they have lost, eternal life and the immortal inheritance. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 124. What is implied by that? Want to look at it a little bit more? <clears throat> 
If sin separates us from God and we refuse to give up our sins, what happens to us? We are separated from the only source of life, right? This, this should be logical, I think. So Seems logical to me. Why, at the end, Satan will actually fall to his knees when he realizes Philippians the two. separation. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Well, it goes on to 10, 11. Yeah. They will realize. The plan of salvation gives us an opportunity to have our sins forgiven, to have our lives changed, and eventually to have a place with God in heaven. So how do we cooperate with God in, his life, in this life-changing experience? And of course, the real question we're getting back to is, do we still need the law? If the law is something imposed, I think so. or is the law a description of the way things are meant to operate? Or will okay, I? you're going to answer the question in light of what you've just said, aren't you? <laughs> and if the law is, is expressed, in fact, back to Galatians 3.19, why then the law, another way of saying it is it was stated. You don't need to make or write out the law if nobody's engaging in that particular behavior. But once you do, then you have to... If it's destructive, then you have to teach the people. And sometimes part of teaching is write things down, just like you've done there. Well, by following the example of Christ, we can learn how life is to be lived. By doing that, we allow God to write the law in our hearts. Couldn't we just do right because it is right? That's the, the highest level of moral development, isn't it? Well, yeah. Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. It's, it's only in, in contact with God that uh, we have these things. All the things of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These, he is the source of all those things, and only in communion and and connection with him do those things manifest ourselves well, in our, in themselves in our lives. If, if you were to name someone that you thought was a saint, apart from Jesus, of course, is, he's a separate category, a human being, fully human, that was close to being a saint in the Bible, who would you pick? Are you using a Catholic uh, version of, of the interpretation of what I, a saint I, is or Paul's version no. in First Corinthians? Okay, well, no, I, I can't use Paul's version. You, you know what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say someone who lived as close to God really as possible right. and Enoch. gave us... Yeah? Enoch. Enoch would be a good example. Can you think of another Abraham. one or two? What? Abraham. Abraham was pretty oh, good. Daniel. Daniel, Job, and John Paul. The, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Elijah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and even though he went through some periods of depression. And I, and I would include Paul. I mean, look at what that guy went through. You know, just incredible. Um, well, so in, in the, our passage for this week, Paul addressed the formerly Jewish Christians in Galatia. He talked about conditions as they were before the coming of Christ. What does it mean to be kept under the law? Okay, let's deal with some of these passages, some of these cliches, if you will. What does it mean to be kept under the law? Our life is governed by the law instead of being governed by the spirit of Jesus, okay. which is entirely founded on pure love. Okay. And, um, I mean, just in terms of very practical things, are we governed by the law of gravity? How many of you have violated the law of gravity? Can't. Impossible. And there's a whole lot of other laws, physical laws. But now we're talking about the spiritual laws. Are the laws included in the moral law specifically, what we call sometimes call the Ten Commandments, are those things descriptive laws or are they proscriptive laws? We've talked about that in the past. Proscriptive laws are things like the speed limit which is set more or less arbitrarily by some government organization. A descriptive law is like the law of gravity. It just describes how things are. So which are they? 
And in the, this context, it would be prescriptive. Well, and that's another story, yeah, another part of the uh, picture. It, yeah. it sounds too close to pro, but it really is pre. It's, 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 if you want to do it, yeah. if you want to learn how it's supposed to function, mm -hmm. these, th this is the outline. And you're free to reject it. And there's consequences uh, of associated with the rejection. Well, one possible interpretation of the expression under the law is, su is suggested by Ro Ro Galatians 4.21. It's not stated such, but it's possibly suggested is that if we could somehow keep the law, we could be saved. I think that's what Paul had in mind? No. 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 Well, I, if ultimately, ultimately, if, if we could do it like Jesus did from beginning to end, it wouldn't be a problem. We just can't. See, the, the problem isn't that the, syst the system wouldn't work. The problem is that we can't do it. So let's not blame the law. In other words, what I'm saying, it's not the law's fault. Where's the fault? The fault is in us, isn't it? So if we take the idea that uh, God never intended for us to really be able to keep the law, we're really rejecting Christ, as in Galatians 5, 2 to 4. Another meaning of under the law is to be under the condemnation of the law because we have broken it. Now, how many of us qualify for that? You know, as sinners, we are all under the law in that sense. The law is a kind of mirror. If we look in the mirror and see that our face is dirty and then walk away and say that we do not need to do anything because we cannot see the dirt anymore, does that make sense? Um, I'm sure many of you have examples of this at your house too, but we have a, a famous picture in our family of our first grandson. And his mother gave him the uh, peanut butter and jelly, well, open-faced peanut butter and jelly, a piece of bread with a peanut butter and jelly on it, and let him eat it himself. And you know, he's got <laughs> jelly all over his face. And it's just a precious picture. You know how kids are, you know, by the time he gets this thing in his mouth, you know, and, and he thought he was just fine, smiling away. <laughs> he had no problem with all that jelly on his face. So, I mean, and, and a lot of Christians think that's the approach. I mean, if I can't see my sin or I don't think I, I don't think it's serious, it's fine, right? So, who? What do we need to straighten us out on that kind of stuff? We need the law, right? Show our, us our need. Or, Even yeah. Or to if we're seeking to walk in love, we're seeking to follow Jesus. Uh, it can tell us if we're drifting because our minds can rationalize a lot of things that yep. we want to do, and uh, but the law will tell us kind of like these warning yeah. things that are in cars. Now you start to drift, or there's a somebody somebody in your blind spot. There's this flashing light. Yeah. Beep and Very good. Well, and so we could say that the simple outline of what we're not supposed to do is in the Ten Commandments. The out perfect outline of what we should do is in the life of Jesus. Right? Well, Romans 5, 10, you are healed yeah. with Jesus' life. So study his life. And so um, is there something wrong with the law? Paul seemed no. to think it was okay. Paul thought it was okay, and you're not so sure. <laughs> well, it has a purpose. It has a purpose. It's, it's, it's like a sort of a road map, if you want to call it today's standards. Yeah. It gives you guidance. Yeah. Well, Paul in Romans 13 has some couple of very interesting verses, verses 8 and 10. Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. And then verse 10, uh, hold on here. Um, where is my, oh, if you love someone, you will never do them wrong. To love then is to obey the whole law. So we're now asking, okay, is, is there ever wrong, in, is it ever wrong to love people and to treat them in a loving manner? Is that ever wrong? If you always did that, you wouldn't be sinning, would you? Amazing, huh? Well, are we humans able to do that? Not in of ourselves. There's always a hook in our human love. 
Let's review Romans 3. Or as, I don't know if you've seen the YouTube video of this Jewish rabbi who talks about fish love. No. That there's a, he, he says to this man, why do you, are you eating this fish? And he says, uh, because I love fish. And he says, oh, you love the fish. That's why you caught it, boiled it, and you're eating it. And <laughs> uh, do you really love the fish? And he's pointing out that if you really love the fish, you would preserve it and keep yeah. it, you know, and too much of love is like that. We, we say we love, the, these, these couple love each other, but what they do is they, they like what the other person does for them, mm -hmm. not uh, thinking in terms of what uh, I can do for this other person. So it was an interesting uh, illustration. Okay, very good. Well, that's, that's a good one. What does the law actually do for us? Well, it's supposed to keep us and guard us. Two, it confines us or encloses us in our sinful condition by pointing out where we have failed to keep the law. The law is very good as, at showing us, if we are honest and looking at it, that we are all sinners. This does not suggest that there is a problem with the law itself. Paul clearly believed that the law was good. Thus the law be becomes a kind of babysitter, guard, protector, even disciplinarian, until we come to understand the real purpose of the law and the gospel. Well, so if the law is good, can it be misused? Of course. Can good things be misused? Sure. Well, there are drugs that are intended to relieve pain. I have to deal with them every day. But they can become addicting and they can kill people who abuse them. Sharp knives are essential. We use them all the time. They, they have a very useful function. When used properly, they can also be used to kill. So it's not the thing itself which is bad. It's the question is, how is it used? Way back in Moses' day in, December, in, December, in Deuteronomy 27 and 28, God spelled out, okay, to the children of Israel, if you do all these things, you will be blessed. If you do all these things, you'll be cursed. And what did they do? They claimed all the privileges and they failed to do the responsibilities. Do we ever do that? Who were the ultimate law keepers in the days of Jesus? Pharisees. The Pharisees. What do we know about their behavior, their lifestyle? You realize that Pharisees had, if you're a really faithful Pharisee, you had to fast two days a week. That probably kept them from gaining too much weight, right? And they went through elaborate ritual cleanings and other requirements. You almost had to be independently wealthy because it, took, it was almost a full-time job, job just to do all the things you were supposed to do as a Pharisee. Well, you know, they, they multiplied rules and they multiplied laws and every little destruction. I mean, God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. On six days shall you labor and do all your work. Oh, well, we need to define what work is. And they had elaborate. Uh, if you ever get a chance, look at the, look in the Misha, Mishnah and see all pages and pages and pages spelled out of rules about how to keep the Sabbath. Of course, the... Good thing we don't do that. Yeah, good thing we don't do that. They, uh, they believed, the Jews believed in Jesus' day that they, God's blessings were exclusively for them. The Gentiles, forget them. They had no... Us, who are Gentiles, no chance for us. Well, then there's that famous verse that we need to talk about a little bit. Galatians 3.24. We've already read it once. Look at it again. And so the law was in charge of us, my version says, until Christ came. In charge of us. The law was in charge of us. What does that mean? The yeah, Greek word is... Created boundaries. Yeah, okay. The Greek word is paedagogos. It's been translated as schoolmaster, disciplinarian, tutor, trainer, teacher, guide, the one in charge of us, a slave to look after us, even custodian, babysitter, child conductor, or guardian. Okay, which one do you think is those is the, is the closest? 
Well, here's, here's the truth of, the, of, of we want to really want to understand what that word is. The Pythagoras was a slave in Roman society who was placed in a position of authority over his master's sons from the time they turned six or seven until they reached maturity. In addition to providing for his charges physical needs, such as drawing their bath, providing them with food and clothes, protecting them from any danger, the Pythagoras also was responsible for making sure the master's sons went to school and did their homework. And one of his most important jobs was to make sure that they got safely to school and safely home, as we'll see in a moment. In addition, he was expected not only to teach and practice moral vir virtues himself, but uh, to also ensure that the boys learn to practice their virtues themselves. That's quoted from our Bible study guide. So these paedagogoi, that would be the plural, tended to be very strict disciplinarians. They did not hesitate to whip or cane their subjects. Does this imply a negative picture of the law? Doesn't the law rebuke and condemn us as sinners by pointing out our sins? Do we like to have our sins pointed out? No. No? <laughs> okay, so now the next question. Which law was that verse talking about? Well, I, the Pythagoras yeah. was really a person who was training children yeah. as opposed to educating the no. youth. He wasn't their teacher. No, he was a trainer. Mm -hmm. It's only when the child reaches a certain level of development and training that the child can begin to think for himself. At that point, he needs an educator. So the law can serve as training, mm -hmm. but if we remain at that level and we are just animals being trained all our lives, we're never free, mm -hmm. and thus we never really become loving because love implies freedom. Yep. As a result of it, we need to grow, and as Paul and Hebrews and other places, we're told we shouldn't remain with just the milk That's right. of the mother. Peter said the same thing. Peter, yes. Yeah. So, and, and let's, let's talk about the practical issues in Paul's day, so that we just get a rounded picture of what this Pythagoras was like. There, the majority of the people who lived in the Mediterranean world in Paul's days were slaves. Probably 60% of the population, some have estimated, were slaves. Now, these are not slaves because of the color of their skin or because, well, some of them were, were slaves because they had been conquered from some nations and brought home and forced into slavery. But a, a lot of the people who were slaves were slaves because they got themselves into debt or something like that, and they couldn't pay their debts. And so they would sell themselves into slavery to pay their debt, and after a certain period of time, having paid their debts off, they would be free again. Well, think about that for a moment. If you could kidnap the son of a wealthy Roman, for example, and hold him hostage and demand a ransom, you could pay for your freedom, couldn't you? So these paedagogoi had a serious responsibility. I mean, not obviously, not everyone could afford to have a full-time person to train their children. Um, but some could, and these were yet generally the wealthy people. And so their job was to protect the lives of these young people in addition to these other things that they did. Um, so, what does the law do for us? Does it protect us? We usually think of it not so much as protecting, don't we? It's not the first thing we think about when we think about the law, right? Well, it protects me if you obey the laws. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not just you, but everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It also might pr protect a person that They'll stick around a little bit longer, and maybe they will learn the, the true meaning. Yeah. It's a protection to the person, as opposed to us. I mean, if somebody doesn't come in to break into your house to steal, even though he liked to do so, it's, it's kind of a blessing for us. I, I, can, I can take a very simple example. I have quite a number of patients who have HIV. How do they get the HIV? Well, it wasn't by obeying the commandments, I can tell you. Generally. <laughs> they might have yeah. had a transfusion 
Yeah, that's for a period of time. And, and I, have a, I have a close relative who unfortunately was in a very serious accident in, when they were very young and got not, hep not HIV, but hepatitis C. Unfortunately, is being treated now. So, and fortunately, there's a good treatment for it now. But the same story, HIV, hepatitis C is often the same, the same story. If you, if you do foolish things, you, you come up with serious consequences. So is it the purpose of the law to correct our errors, our sins? No, it's to point them out. Yeah. Gives us feedback. Which is what a tutor does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> dangerous to go over this way. Okay. This is not part of the, the path it's, it's, that God It is should leading. be a kind of a protecting wall around us, right? Mm -hmm. It says, out there is dangerous. Out there is dangerous. Don't go there. So forth, right? Well, and ultimately, of course, the way to, to successfully stay on the right path is to follow as close as possible the example of Jesus Christ. God wants us to open our eyes and then he encourages us to turn and run to him for help and salvation. We need the law to help us clarify what is right and what is wrong, but God never intended for us to stop there. Even in the Old Testament, there are good examples of how the law should be used. Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. Um, well, let, let me, I don't have time to read that whole thing, but I want to read one part of it. Look down toward the end of that. It says, the king, and he's talking about if you ever get a king in the future, make sure it's not a foreigner. Then the king is not to have many wives. Does that remind you of anybody? Because this would make him turn away from the Lord, and he is not to make himself rich with silver and gold. Does that remind you of any Hebrew king? When he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy, kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. Can you imagine how different the story of Israel would have been if they had done that? Well, it's interesting, if you read through that section, it talks about all sorts of stuff they weren't supposed to do and what would happen if, if they did do it. And guess what? All those predictions came true. In fact, the predictions are so uncanny, uncannily accurate, that many scholars don't believe that the book of Deuteronomy could have been written before maybe the days of Ezra or somewhere way down, not by Moses. That was a thousand years before that. They think it was written a thousand years later because nobody can no predict the future, not even God. So how could he know that all those things would happen if you disobeyed the law? Of course, you don't believe that. You believe that uh, no. it was written by... I absolutely believe that Deuteronomy was written by Moses, and I believe that God has the full capability to pre of predicting the future. Well, that's the key part, is that since these people believe that God can't predict the future, it's impossible for him for this to have been written way back before. Well, and if you go to the real higher critics, the early higher critics, they didn't believe any of the Bible could have been written before about 600 B.C. because writing didn't even exist back then. Well, of course, that's all been proven completely false. You know. Well, in light of all this, where do we find ourselves? Look at a couple of passages. Romans 8, 1-3. There is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. And that's, this comes right after Romans 7. And what is Romans 7 all about? Paul says, the good things I want to do, I can't do. And the bad things I don't want to do, that's what I do, right? But now there's no condemnation for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, because human nature was weak, so he says very clearly, God, I mean, the law can't do this, but what the law could not do, God did. This is the verse we read a little bit earlier. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son, who came with a nature like sinful human nature, to do away with sin. And if we had five hours to discuss, we would talk about how the death of Christ, the life and death of Jesus, 
does away with sin, but we don't have time to talk about that right now. Um, and look at, well, let's move on. Well, I suppose we can take time. Can you give a 30-second summary of how the life and death of Christ takes away sin? I, uh, I think that uh, I did it in a couple of sentences a little while ago. The life of Jesus shows us what it's like to live a righteous life, what it's like to live a life in, in cooperation with God, a life that's, that's guided by God's Spirit that follows the example of Jesus. Anything apart from that, anything outside of that is sin. And sin ultimately will result in, in death. And Jesus died the death of sinners. We read those quotations earlier. He died the death of sinners. So you have a choice. Do you want to die the way Jesus died? We're not talking about crucifixion here. We're not talking about beatings and crowns of thorns. We're talking about dying of sin. That will be the ultimate death at the end. The second death is described by the, in the book of Revelation. So there's a, a many, many attempt. Okay. Um, Romans 6, 14 and 15 is another famous passage. Let's look at that real quick here. Um, sin must not be your master, for you do not live under law, but under God's grace. What then? Shall, sin, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under God's grace? By no means. So, in other words, even though we're not under the law, does that, does that, when we're not under the law, that gives us permission to sin freely? Of course not. Because as soon as, I mean, if you think of the law as a kind of fence, and, and the, the, the Pythagoras Goss is outside there, and he's not going to bother you so long as you're inside, you're, the teacher is teaching you or whatever, and you're doing what you're supposed to, the law is not going to bother you. But what happens if you try to jump the fence and head in the other direction? There's the Pythago Goss there to grab you and say, no, son, that's not where you belong. You belong back inside there. So, doesn't that suggest that the law still has a function? By following the example of Jesus Christ, we eventually will learn that doing what is right is always the best plan. When we do what is right, we naturally keep the law. James says that in a couple places, 125 and 212. He calls it the law of liberty. How can you call a law a law of liberty? Does that make any sense? We usually think of... Truth will set you free. Isn't, isn't the truth a law? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it is God's plan that by studying the life of, of Christ, we may behold and become changed. Great Controversy 555. As we spend time contemplating the life of Christ, we learn to practice good behaviors, and the Holy Spirit writing the law in our hearts transforms us into His image. And there's that famous verse also that um, it's a little harder to follow, but look at it. 2 Corinthians 3.18 All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces, and that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into His likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. So by reflecting Jesus, how do we reflect Jesus? By beholding Him. Yeah, exactly. A prism reflects the light that uh, strikes it. This, of course, does not do away with the need for the law. If we get careless or wander into new territory and disobedience, the law will quickly point out what needs to happen and tell us to correct our error. The Pythago Gus was not a teacher at school. His job was to get the children safely to school, make sure they were safe while at school, and then to get them safely home. Why was that a problem? Well, we mentioned already that sixty percent of the people living in the Mediterranean region in those days were slaves. Often they became slaves because they could not pay their debts. If a slave could kidnap one of the children of a wealthy family and hold that child for ransom, he might be able to pay off his debt and go free. So how does this fit with the function of the law? Do we have dangers if we wander out of our safe territory? We wander into sin, what happens? The devil is alive, alive and well, as a, right? Yeah, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Well, the law protects us by spelling out specifically 
what we are to do and not to do until by studying the life of Christ we learn to do what is right because it is right. Is there ever a time that we no longer need the Pythagoras? What, would, what, would hap what kind of conditions could apply where we would not need, we would never need the law? Well, I think as long as we dwell in this nature that we have here, the angels uh, didn't know there was such a thing as a law. So there obviously is a way for that to function uh, just by continually being holding the face of the Father. But uh, if uh, we're too easily confused, we're too easily, uh, we too easily rationalize whatever behavior it is that we, our heart goes after, our deceitful heart, it's uh, deceitfully wicked above all things. So we need the, the law to kind of uh, be a, a hedge about us, as you said, a fence, mm -hmm. uh, so that we, uh, when we begin to drift from God's uh, immediate presence. Uh, Ellen White says, the reason why so many are left to themselves in places of temptation is that they do not set the Lord always before them. When we permit our communion with God to be broken, our defense is departed from us. Not all your good purposes and good intentions will enable you to withstand evil. You must be men and women of prayer. And then she goes on. And, uh, I won't. It, that's from Ministry of Healing 510, and then you can go on to 11. And she closes that with let every, uh, talks about um, talking to, cultivating the habit of talking to the Savior is going about. Let every breath be a prayer. Here's a, a verse, which, a passage which we've, we've recorded in one of our earlier lessons. Let me just record it again. Desire of Ages, page 668, paragraph 3. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. That's, we have to consent. So blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. See, and now if, you, if you're operating like that, you don't need the law. Uh, the will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. I think that would probably negate the necessity of a pedagogos. Well, as our time is drawing conclusion, uh, to a conclusion here, um, I'd like to point out something very interesting. This passage of scripture that we're talking about today was emphasized uh, by two young men at the 1888 General Conference. And there was a lot of discussion there about whether or not the law that was involved there was the moral law or was it the ceremonial law. And uh, E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones said it was the moral law. Uh, many of the church elders said, no, it's a ceremonial law. And Ellen White, writing about it sometime later, said these words. Here's a, some absolutely scary words, but listen carefully. An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth, what would be the truth about which law was it and, and how God uses law, lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message to Brother E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded. By the way, this was a general conference committee in meeting. Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, is that the latter rain? The special power of the Holy Spirit? Sounds like it. Aren't we praying for that? We should be. That God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole world with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. Doesn't that suggest that if we had not opposed that message, we might now be in the kingdom of heaven? Well, Ellen White goes on to talk about what that message was. The law of Ten Commandments, that's what we're talking about now, 
is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side. Does the law protect us? Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness in obedience. As received in Christ, it works in us a purity of character that will bring joy to us through eternal ages. To the obedient, it is a wall of protection. We behold in it the goodness of God, who by revealing to men the immutable principles of righteousness, seeks to shield them from the evils that result from transgression. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. How many people see God like that? The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result, not the punishment. It's not that God gets angry with them and punishes them for disobeying. It brings a sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character. Is this a consequence or a punishment? No. It reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result, not punishment, is ruin and death. Select the messages, book one, page 234 and 235. Wow. So how do we look at the law in our day? You have to search for that document, don't you? It's not uh, part of the... Well, it's, it's in that book. I understand, but it's not something in popular uh, no. preaching. No, that popular, that pro you probably never heard a sermon on that one. Um, it's not widely popularized. So do we see the law in, in, as full of mercy? Do we think of the, when you think of mercy, is the first thing you think about of the law? Did our own General Conference brethren back in 1880 actually turn back the latter rain? Could the gospel have gone forward and been finished more than a hundred years ago? Could the same thing happen now? Have we learned our lesson? If you look at the chapter on why the delay in Testimonies of Ministers 694 to 697, it says that there was already great delay in 1868. What should we do about that in our day? A kind and loving Father, what incredible presentation this has been to think about all that you wished you could do with us and with our ancestors in the faith. Help us not to make the mistakes that they made, but to see the law as you want us to see it, to recognize its, its proper function, and most of all, to follow the example of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may soon be a part of that kingdom in heaven is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.